Hey team, Andre from High Performance Academy. Welcome along to another one of our webinars. And today we're going to be looking into the setup and configuration and validation for that matter of a pit limiter or for that matter, any kind of vehicle speed limiter. We're gonna be working through this using our Motec M1 that's fitted to our SR20 powered Toyota 86. But essentially a lot of what you're going to learn today will be applicable irrespective of what ECU you're personally interested in. Before we do that though, I just wanna cover off a few things that have been going on and we'll start with the current giveaway that we have got running. We have partnered with Racetech, a race seat manufacturer from from right here in New Zealand. Uh, we exclusively use Racetech's seats in our own vehicles and Racetech are also a really big name across the world, uh, being fitted to the likes of the Australian Supercars series as well as several GT3 manufacturer built race cars. So you can be assured that this is an absolute quality piece. Uh, not only are you getting a Racetech seat, you will be getting specifically their 4100HR, which is their head restraint seat. So it's a nice feature that a lot of race seat manufacturers are coming out with now, which is where you've got some restraints around the side of the driver's helmet. And this particularly helps limit the potential for damage to your head and neck in a sideways impact. Uh, so that particular seat, we're also pairing with a set of six point harnesses. Uh, make sure you stay snug in that seat. And we're also giving away our driver, race driver training courses as well. Total package deal is worth over 2000 US dollars. Uh, it's only just recently got going. So you've got about 20 days left to get your name into the draw. It is absolutely free to enter. There are a few little tasks you can also complete that will give you more entries into the draw and give you a few more chances to win. So uh, we'll drop a link into the comments that you can follow that you can get your name into that draw. We wish you the best of luck. Now we've recently come back from World Time Attack over in Sydney and this was great because we've been stuck in little old New Zealand uh, for the last two years thanks to COVID, mostly the same for everyone around the world but uh, while New Zealand is not a bad place to get stuck, uh, we were starting to really get a bit itchy about getting out and seeing some of our friends from uh, across the channel over there in Australia as well as the rest of the world but that'll be coming later this year. Uh, this was a another great event in the books for Ian Baker and the World Time Attack team. And while we've also managed to restock our video files, we'll be adding to the our YouTube channel over the coming uh, weeks and months with all of the content that we shot over there. Uh, I did want to give you uh, maybe just a, a quick taster of some of the uh, aspects that I found interesting over there. So we'll jump across to my laptop screen and uh, we'll start with an engine, not a car, but uh, this is something that uh, has come up recently a couple of times and I, I just wanted to address it here. So uh, this was uh, DeShell's DeShell Performance's stand in the trade stand area. Uh, DeShell specializes in Subaru, EJ and FA series builds. Uh, but the specific focus of this is we can see here, uh, this is fitted with a set of ARP main studs or main case bolts as they're often referred to in the Subaru world. And this simply holds the two halves of the crankcase together. The Boxer engine obviously is a little unique because we've got a horizontally opposed uh, engine configuration. One of the problems with this, or not really necessarily a problem, one of the uh, aspects that comes about from this configuration is that the engine is essentially trying to force itself apart. So what we'll find on any uh, performance EJ series engine, when we pull it apart, these little areas here, uh, which is where they contact the other sides of the case, you'll often see uh, what are referred to as fret marks. And that simply means that the cases have been pulling apart enough to allow a little bit of relative movement. Now that's pretty normal even in lightly modified or even stock engines to a degree, but uh, in high performance applications that fretting can become so bad that it actually wears away and then micro welds parts of the case uh, to the other half. So not great and as an aspect, an upshot of that, you also end up uh, with basically a path of oil pressure loss. So this can result in uh, reduced oil pressure at high load, high boost, high RPM nothing that we want. So obviously one of the options is to go to these ARP studs or case bolts in order to combat that. 
The bit that's really easy to overlook, and this doesn't just go for EJ series engines, it's really an aspect of just about every engine, but definitely ones that use an alloy block. These aftermarket studs or bolts produce so much additional clamping force that generally what they're going to do is distort the main bearing tunnel where the crankshaft sits. If you do not correct this, it's going to mess with your bearing clearances royally to the point where it's likely you won't actually be able to turn the crankshaft. Obviously, this is no good. So this is a normal machining process that we go through where the machinist that we use line hones the block and that basically gets everything back so that that main bearing tunnel is on size, perfectly concentric, perfectly round. Now the reason I bring this up is I have been hearing from a few people and I do know about this technique, not that I can recommend it, uh, where they have basically bought an aftermarket stud kit and then ignored the manufacturer's instructions and instead uh, only took the studs down to the point where they start measuring distortion in the block. Now while I know that this is a technique that many people are using and many people are probably getting away with, uh, I definitely can't recommend that. If you're under talking the fastener, you risk them loosening in operation. They're definitely not achieving the clamp that the fastener was designed for or intended to produce. Essentially you're not getting the benefits of the product you've purchased, so why bother? If you're not prepared to have the block line honed, uh, then you're not getting the proper use of those fasteners. You might as well stick to using factory fasteners if that is going to be the case. So something I feel reasonably strongly about, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So there you go, just a, a little uh, pointer for that if you are fitting aftermarket studs. Next one was on Plasma Man stand, and intercoolers I know it's pretty hard to get excited about, I'm only going to br briefly deal with this, but uh, this is something that I saw a number of times while I was running my own performance workshop and this is where people had bought ch cheap Chinese intercooler cores and the problem is that on the outside they actually look quite good and some of them even were for a long period of time. Uh, I got to a situation where we were tuning a car and the intake air temperatures were absolutely through the roof even at relatively low boost and it just wasn't making any power. After a bit of fact finding, fault finding I should say, we ended up pulling the intercooler off the car and this shot here where we're looking through the inside of the intercooler, so this is obviously the airflow path, we can see that the internal passes through the intercooler actually have internal fins in them and this is really really important, that gives a surface area that the air is going to flow over and it's important because this is where we get that heat transfer, the heat gets drawn out of the air and transferred into the aluminium fins of that intercooler. So in the application I was just mentioning where we had that car on the dyno, when we pulled the intercooler off, that pass that we're looking at there was essentially almost completely open. So it seems like whoever the Chinese supplier was had decided it was cheaper and easier to make these cords with no internal fins, really destroyed the intercooler's usefulness, it just wasn't working. Visually from the outside looked like any other intercooler but it just wasn't able to do an adequate job of getting the heat out of the air and transferring it into the aluminium. Where Therefore it can then transfer it out into the ambient air. So just understand there, not all intercoolers are created equal. We swapped to uh, another brand that had internal fins while the car was on the, on the dyno because it was a standardised 600 by 300 by 76 mil core and I think off the top of my head we gained around about 40 kilowatts at the wheels and air temperatures were immediately under control again. So just wanted to uh, bring your attention to that if you're shopping for intercoolers. Uh, another one, uh, we know there's a lot of debate around drive-by wire throttle bodies and regardless whether you believe in them or don't you're going to find there's not a lot of professional motorsport now that isn't using drive-by wire. The advantages simply massively outweigh any perceived disadvantages. I'll let you know a little secret those perceived disadvantages just don't exist. Lag, it, it is not an issue with modern uh, drive-by-wire systems. However, they aren't infallible, they aren't completely bulletproof and we are seeing some issues with an occasional race car, particularly those where the engine is solid mounted or very stiffly mounted in the chassis and this comes down to transmission of uh, vibration and harshness into the throttle body. And uh, we saw a few years ago under Suzuki and the Scorch Racing S15 had issues with this, basically 
the throttle body was occasionally dropping out and uh, going into a limp home mode. We had a similar issue with our own SR20 when the main bearing caps cracked, creating a vibration and the throttle just wasn't doing exactly what it should do. It was closing when I didn't want it to uh, and obviously that's not a fast way around the track irrespective. Uh, solution for this which we're seeing a lot of the top cars at World Time Attack now incorporate here uh, is that they are isolating the throttle body from the inlet manifold. So in this case it's a second uh, V-band style clamp there uh, both sides of the throttle body. It's pretty normal to have uh, this one here uh, where we're adapting using a, in this case I think it's a EFI Solutions or Tux uh, V-band style clamp or Wigan style clamp I should say really. Allow some uh, some radial uh, displacement as well as uh, minimizing the transfer of vibration through these components. But uh, yeah, using one on the plenum side is not so typical. So we're seeing a lot of that. So if you are seeing some weirdness from your drive-by-wire throttle body and you've got a very specific application there, again, not needed for a road car. It really comes down to these uh, situations where the engine is either solid mounted or very stiffly mounted in the chassis. Uh, now I just wanted to go through one of the standouts, obviously there were a lot and again we've got some great content coming out over the coming weeks but uh, just one of the standouts for me uh, because I'm a 4G63 uh, fanatic uh, was Chris Alexander's R32 GTR and uh, unfortunately for some reason I don't actually have an external shot of this, uh, it's a, a full carbon fibre R32 GTR or ex the external bodywork is, uh, this is an existing carbon uh, it's run at World Time Attack before, but of course being a GTR it was powered by a Nissan RB inline 6 cylinder. Uh, for this year Chris has partnered up uh, with uh, TRP Performance and uh, we spoke to Dom Rigoli about this. Uh, it's obviously running a 4G63 Mitsubishi engine which on face value might seem like an odd choice. Now speaking to Dom about this, the, the aim was to get the weight of the car down but also to get the mass closer to the centre line of the car. Now the RB is a long motor being an inline 6 so that puts a lot of the mass forward of the front axle line and what you can see here is uh, that essentially if we draw a line between the strut towers there, uh, the engine is actually be behind that strut tower so it's obviously been moved back uh, as well. There's limits in terms of firewall modification that mean that you can't move the, the engine back too far, that firewall needs to rem remain uncut from memory. Uh, but yeah, 4G63 instead of the uh, venerable uh, RB26, 28, RB30, whichever uh, you prefer. So this engine is making about 1030 wheel horsepower running a Borg Warner EFR 9280. So it's a big turbo for a, a relatively small capacity engine. Uh, this one is 2.2, it is still using the Evo 9. Myvex. So that's one interesting element there and obviously a, a bit of an eye opener for any uh, Nissan R32 GTR. The other aspect that goes hand in hand with the uh, the engine change from the last time the car ran is it's now running an Albans ST6 transaxle so that's mounted at the rear of the car. Sort of a little bit like the R35 GTR concept where instead of a conventional uh, gearbox and transfer case mounted straight off the back of the engine, a prop shaft runs off the engine all the way to the rear of the car and then the gearbox, the clutch assembly and the differential are all mounted at the rear of the car. So that again just helps get that weight distribution a little bit closer to what the team are hoping for whether that's 50-50, I'm, I'm not privy to that information but uh, yeah get, gets the weight off the front axle line to a degree and obviously the aim there is uh, to improve the handling. Speaking of handling, uh, this car also has a fairly dramatic upgrade in terms of the suspension so you can see uh, from this shot here some uh, custom suspension pickups, uh, a double wishbone suspension arrangement and if we just go back as well you can see uh, quite an elaborate push rod damper configuration and also the anti-roll bar is a blade style anti-roll bar, nothing particularly unusual about blade anti-roll bars because they are easy to adjust in terms of anti-roll bar stiffness. The location however is relatively unique being that it's mounted in the scuttle panel there at the base of the windscreen so uh, not a 
lot of uh, stock R32 left. Uh, part of the rules state that the front strut towers need to remain so it's exactly what we can see here. We've got strut towers, they're not doing anything but they are there so the rules are all kept happy. Uh, not in shot but also this is now fitted with a Bosch Motorsport ABS unit. Uh, we can also see in the shot here uh, same arrangement that I was mentioning where the, the drive-by-wire throttle body is isolated pre uh, and post throttle body from the plenum chamber. Last little note on this one as well and we've done a tech feature on the, this specific technology but you can see this tiny little drive-by-wire throttle body that's mounted on the charge plumbing running up to the uh, actual throttle body. Uh, so this serves two purposes, the first of which is that it's a, a blow-off valve, electronic blow-off valve, so obviously when the driver gets off the throttle that can open. Uh, more importantly though, and the real reason for this is it acts as an anti-surge device. So that 9280 turbo, it's a big turbo for a small capacity engine and uh, we can get into situations particularly when we're targeting higher boost pressures at part throttle where we're getting dangerously close to running the compressor into surge. And when we do run into surge, it's not great for the turbocharger, it also can upset the balance of the car and you sort of get into a situation where the car becomes a little bit and erratic that can then set the driver's foot up on the throttle sort of oscillating which kind of makes the whole thing worse obviously not a situation you want uh, when you're trying to balance the car on the edge of traction so uh, this coupled with some clever programming in the ECU can allow that uh, blow off valve uh, drive by wire throttle body I should say to open when the turbo is approaching the surge line to prevent that surge situation occurring so just allowing uh, a more aggressive boost strategy and a larger turbo to be operated safely and reliably on a small capacity engine. All right, so only a few little uh, tidbits there from World Time Attack, but as I've said, we've got heaps of great content coming, so uh, keep an eye on our social media for that. Uh, now, just give me a second, I'll head back across to my laptop here and we'll get our next little segment loaded up. Uh, so if you haven't already been listening to our podcast, if you're not aware that we've got one, well, we do, it's the HPA Tuned In podcast. I'd love it if you could go and subscribe to that and have a listen. If you are an automotive fanatic and you do listen to podcasts at the moment, uh, this is going to be a great way of absorbing some excellent content. We've had some really great people on the podcast already, got some really exciting names coming up uh, as well. So uh, jumping over to my laptop screen, uh, our, our latest release is our interview with Mike Burrows from Stance Works. And if you haven't heard that name before, uh, Mike's kind of best known for doing things a little bit uh, unusual such as this Ferrari 308 GTB which he has shoehorned a 1200 horsepower uh, K20 turbo engine into the back of so uh, he's obviously going to annoy a few Ferrari purists but I think uh, that's actually part of the fun for him. Uh, he's also a uh, really well known BMW uh, specialist and uh, he's, he's really well known for one of his old builds which was called Rusty Slammington. Uh, I've been following Stance Works blog for a, a really long time so it was great to actually uh, be able to sit down and have a chance to chat with Mike. And uh, Mike's really multifaceted in what he can do and he's essentially completely self-taught so uh, right down to fabrication, computer aided design uh, using Fusion 360, uh, his TIG welding, his MIG welding, uh, basically there's not a lot that Mike can't do so some really good information in there on basically how to get those skills, how to upskill yourself, how to use uh, the, how to get your uh, mind into the right space where nothing is impossible. Uh, also some great tips because Mike specializes in uh, project car builds. Some great tips on how to manage your project, uh, how to make sure that you actually see it through to the end and don't get sidetracked or uh, disillusioned which unfortunately probably my guess happens in 7 or 8 out of 10 project cars that get started they just never get finished and I'm guilty of that myself. So uh, check that out on HPA Tune in you can listen to that anywhere you currently listen to podcasts or head to hpa-tunedin.com all right we'll finish up there but i'll just one more reminder for that race tech seat 
harness and course giveaway 2000 us dollars worth of value there get your name into the draw there's only 20 days left for that to run so please don't miss out it really is a great uh, giveaway particularly if you are considering getting out on a racetrack anytime soon make sure you do it in comfort style and most importantly in safety all right thanks for watching give me a moment here we'll get started with today's lesson if you like that video make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber make sure you're subscribed we release a new video every week and if you like free stuff we've got a great deal for you click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson